All righty, well, uh, welcome, guys. Uh, in order to just jump straight in and kick things off, um, I'm interested to find out from both of you guys if there were particular moments in time where you realised that, that this is the kind of thing that you wanted to do. So maybe, firstly, Elena, was there a single catalyzing moment, uh, an enough is enough moment, when you took the leap into environmental activism? Um, well, yeah, I think that there was. I um, grew up in Lake Tahoe, and it's a really beautiful place if you haven't been there. Uh, and in 2014, I was actually uh, midway through the Olympic qualifiers, and one of our events was to be held in Tahoe, and a couple weeks before, uh, this is midwinter in January, uh, the event got canceled because there wasn't enough snow to build our courses. Um, so because of that cancellation, they ended up holding three events in three days that were supposed to be held over the course of two weeks um, in a different location just to kind of make up for the lost time and the lost event. And um, that was the first time really that climate change affected me personally in my career and really in my profession in a really heavy way. Um, that change was really hard on everyone and obviously it's a really stressful year going into the Olympics. Um, so that kind of led into a crazy winter in Tahoe and uh, being my hometown, I was there a few months later when the seasons changed and summer came around and I was walking to the end of boat docks on dry sand. And because of the light winter, uh, we had so much uh, dryness in the air and there was no snow melt. And our lake literally shriveled up. And Lake Tahoe is a huge lake. And it was down to record low levels. And that was really the moment for me where I saw it with my own two eyes. It was affecting you know, my personal career. It was affecting the place that I loved, that I grew up in. It was affecting the community. Uh, you know, a lot of jobs were being lost and sacrificed because of it. Uh, so I would say that was the moment. Okay, uh, interesting. Um, when the climate kind of reaches up and bites us in the places where it hurts most, I, I think that's gonna be kind of a common theme. Um, Chad, you've got uh, quite an academic pedigree for an environmental activist and uh, 20 years with Surfrider. It seems like you were almost destined for the big chair at Surfrider, but I'm wondering if you had a pivotal moment uh, when you decided that this is what you wanted to do. Yeah, two things happened to me when I was in uh, high school and early in college. I, I had the privilege of growing up in Laguna Beach, which is this little paradise, and uh, both of them were actually uh, through my love for ocean rec or outdoor recreation. One was the place I used to go mountain bike behind Laguna Beach basically got cut in half by a toll road and uh, development. They built a whole town called Elysio Viejo in a place that was trails and paths and wilderness. And so that was the shocking. They actually moved more dirt to make Elysio Viejo than they did to make the Panama Canal. They chopped all the mountains off and filled all the valleys. And so, I mean, it's a, you know, there's a community there now and people live there, but it was just so shocking to watch this place just get wiped off the map. So that was one of them. And the other was I grew up lifeguarding in late 80s, early 90s. I got into fishing and spearfishing. And I'd go out there spearfishing with my buddies and we'd barely find anything that, any fish that were legal. We'd come back to the lifeguard department and talk to the older senior lifeguards and say, hey, what are we doing wrong? And they'd look at us and said, oh, the, the ocean's fished out. Just matter of fact, like, like the fish are gone. So I remember just thinking to myself, wow, that's it. I missed it. You know, if you were around in the 60s and 70s, they could, uh, you know, pull abalone off the rock and spearfish for their party that night. And so those two things sort of for me, I was like, okay, I refuse to accept that this is the way things are, the trajectory that things are heading on. So I was like, I'm going to figure out how to stop these things and find solutions. And, you know, now Laguna Beach has a marine reserve, hugely controversial when they were put in. And you go out there and the fish are, fish are thriving. It's teeming with life, so they've turned it around. It's no longer fished out. So it was those two experiences that were the like, you know, kind of oh shit moments for me that got me where I am today. So, thanks for that. 
So, um, Elena, looking at professional athletes, there seems to be something of a split in ideologies across all, all of the different disciplines. Most athletes seem to kind of stay in their lanes and, and stick with what they know and they, they don't tend to speak out too much about these kinds of environmental issues which are real and, and present threats to the, the sports and the places that we love. What's your motivation and do you feel like you have a duty to speak out about climate change? Well, I mean, I think that we are living in a really amazing time where the internet and social media gives influencers and athletes this platform that we may not even have had 10 years ago. Um, and yeah, I feel like it is a responsibility and a really cool opportunity for us to take that platform and stand for pressing issues and you know speak our minds and really raise awareness around things that we're passionate about. And for me, there's a lot of pressing issues in the world right now. There's a lot of things to get worked up about, but I think that climate change is at the top of the list. I mean, if we don't have a world, we won't have all of these other issues either. So um, having that platform, I think, is really a gift, and, and to not use it seems a little foolish. Excellent. Um, Chad, to kind of take the, the surfing perspective on this, um, I know kind of historically, I've been a little surprised at um, the kind of fairly light engagement with professional surfing and surf rider and environmental issues. Do you feel like that's changing at the moment or uh, is that something you still deal with or that, that you think could be more helpful? You know, I think it is changing. There's still not enough surfers. I think speaking out, I think WSL Pure and Reese and what the what they're doing is actually really helping that. And I think we're on the cusp of a change. But go look at the ambassador list uh, at Protect Our Winners and the roster of snow athletes that they have speaking for them and mountaineers and climbers. And it's uh, kind of a who's who of the sport. It's really impressive. And surfing isn't isn't there yet, I don't think. And, um, you know, it's a good question as to why that is. I mean, I think having Jeremy as like the leader is is really helpful. Um, I don't think we, you know, we have some great ambassador. I mean, Greg's Wong's out there. He's been one of the incredible champions. Um, but you know, I think we we have a ways to go. And um, and I think you know, it's also our responsibility to get out there and build those relationships. You know, I spent 20 years and 10 years in school to you know, feel confident and comfortable about the information that I'm able to learn and speak about. And, you know, they were practicing surfing and being an athlete, and it's a different skill set. So it's incumbent upon us, I think, to get out there and be like, hey, I will educate you, I will help you, I will make this easy to, for, so you can use your voice. And, it, I mean, Cassie and Cyrus are talking about fear. I think it's part of this, too. God forbid I speak out, because I might be right. Because, I mean, if you say anything about climate, the trolls come at you really fast. and um, and so it might be part of that too. But you know, so I think part of it's our responsibility as much as it is them. But we, we need, I mean, the oceans are, are a huge part of climate, which we can talk about in a second. And it's, you know, be, they're being impacted dramatically. So the surfing world, uh, if they want to keep surfing and keep doing this, it's got to engage. For sure. Along those uh, kind of lines of engagement and the, the breadth of the issues, Surf riders across the Pacific, Atlantic and Gulf Coast and in the Great Lakes as well. And it sometimes feel like we need you guys pretty much everywhere all at the same time. What kind of challenges come with coordinating and, and managing that scope of work? Yeah, you know, the model at Surfrider truly is a grassroots model. So we have 80 chapters around the country, almost 90 high school and college clubs around the country now too. And, um, you know, the forefathers, the people who came before me that invented the model, built a great model. There's people out there, you know, I see a bunch of our chapter activists here today that are actually doing the work. So we're, we, you know, as a result, we have about 120 campaigns going on at any one time, hundreds of programs, probably 10 beach cleanups across the country every single weekend. So that part of it's awesome, amazing amount of work going on. It's really hard to support it. 
like the first panel NGOs. I mean, I wake up every morning and say, how am I going to fund this organization? We have about 60% of the capacity we need to support that network. And when the volunteers are out there volunteering their time to go clean up their beach or show up at a city council meeting, I feel like us and the people who are actually getting paid this work to do this work are responsible for giving them all the tools they need to be effective advocates. So building that capacity. And then the other thing about surf riders, it's hard to tell one story. So if you're an organization that works on one thing, it's easy to tell that story. We've got someone working on beach access in Maine, border sewage in San Diego, beach erosion in Florida. And so it's a variety of, of issues. And it's hard to sort of tell that one. It's not just plastics, it's all these different things. So communicating that clear, unified message as an organization is tough. Okay. Um, Elena, what do you think can be done on uh, kind of a practical level with the snowboard and, and ski industries to do better when it comes to sustainability and climate issues? Um, well, you know, that's like a catch-22, right? We are probably an industry with a really big carbon footprint and we all want to keep doing what we're doing and running chairlifts and, you know, buying new gear and all of those things and how do you combat that? Um, I think that there are a lot of great companies within the ski and snowboard industry taking really great steps towards sustainability. Um, I know a lot of the companies that I work with, like Volcom and Toyota and Power, you know, they are taking those steps on their own because they see the, the climate change happening and they want to keep this industry going. And so I, I can't say that there's one answer, but just you know, reaching for renewable energies and reusing, you know, different types of, uh, what am I looking for? Lots of, lots of choices. <laughs> yeah, making better choices along the way in lots of different places. Uh. Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, these big companies, they're large and it takes a long time to make change, but there's a lot of progress going and, and, the ski and snowboard industry definitely acknowledges that there's a problem and that there are steps to be made, and I think that that's the first part of the solution. Great. Chad, what's the, uh, what are the most heated battles at the moment with Surfrider, and is there, is there one that gets you more fired up than any of the others? Yeah, that actually is an easy question right now. Um, in, in, in January of this year, the Trump administration proposed opening up 90% of U.S. waters to offshore drilling. And uh, that is, no question, the biggest threat that we have to our coasts in the United States. Um, all the other good work we're doing on habitat protection and clean water and plastic pollution will all be undone if they drill off the coast. And it's more than just spills. It's the infrastructure. It's the climate impacts. Um, there, and so this is the, the big fight that we have in front of us. Um, we are going to hear in um, probably November, December, after the midterms, what the next iteration of that plan looks like. So right now, the fight is, is to wherever you live, is to get involved and make sure your congressmen know that you don't want offshore drilling off your coast. So that's, that's the big fight. I actually brought like a bunch of these little pins, which I will leave up here with a little no drilling. Come up here between the sessions and grab one of these things and, uh, and put it on. If you go to our website, surfrider.org, you can click on a button there and figure out who your congressmen are and call them. Okay, great. Elena, did you have a, a call to action or a, a challenge that you might put to folks? Oh. Yeah, I mean, I think that, Chad, you bring up a, a really good point. A lot of the work that, you know, these nonprofits are doing is really bigger than the inv individual. I mean, it's gr really great to have good practices to recycle, to you know, search for companies that are doing their part to support the environment, but really the big changes come at you know, the governmental level, and I think that Protect Our Winters, that's like their biggest mission right now is to get people to see voting for the environment as part of your purpose as an athlete and as someone who loves the outdoors, not as, you know, this political thing that you don't want to get involved in. Um, because, like you said, everything that everyone's done up to this point to try to combat the trash and, you know, the, the 
emissions that are going out are going to be undone if these policies are put in place. So definitely getting out and voting for the environment. Oh uh, man, I mean the largest voting block at the November 2016 election was the non-voters. So we need to change that and um, you know, the millennial audience, which is inheriting this whole thing, we're also really low turnout. So vote, vote, vote. <laughs> Thank you for that. Right on. I think that's a good point to hand over to Juan I, here. I think that's, that's a great time to actually open it back up. We're going to toss it out to you guys. And uh, who's got some questions out here for these guys? Go ahead, stand up. Hey, thanks. So uh, started off with the notion of sacred places. What comes to mind is, you know, the vortexes by Sedona. Everybody in the world goes to Sedona to commune with the vortex. How do we get our recreational environments to that kind of status where people actually recognize them as sacred places in, in that same kind of world? I mean, I, I'm sure you're going to say the same thing I am as, you know, we love the places that we play. So for me, that was the beaches in Laguna Beach. I'm guessing for you, it was the mountains of Tahoe. Um, every single place is, I'm convinced, is loved by somebody. And so if we all can find it within ourselves to get active and protect those places, and we just multiply that, I think, you know, and you, what you'll find is you, other people who per love their places, you want to go learn about them. So I think we, it's, it, I mean, I'm biased because I think this grassroots way of approach is the best way to get anything done, but I think we go out there and protect our places. And what happens is you fall in love with your place, you start protecting it, and then you learn more about the issues, and all of a sudden, you're pretty soon, you're thinking about it globally. You know, she went from snowboarding and a bad winter to an advocate on climate, and, um, you know, so. Yeah, I mean, I think that you have a specific place that you love, and that's really what brings you back to wanting to protect that place. You know, I think that these sports are what get us to that point. Um, it's the reason why I want to protect the mountains because I love being in the mountains. And uh, I think the best way to start that is really at a local level. And um, again, you know, I think that our elected officials have a lot to do with what places are protected and what places are not. And so really raising that awareness around your community and getting people to realize that, that that voice matters and that they can make that voice heard. Jess, you wanna, you wanna chime in with some of the work that you're doing? Talk about the same thing? Sure. Um, so uh, my kind of response to that issue, and I think that's a really good point, and, and one of the other hats I wear is as a professor in sustainable tourism, and I'm always trying to make the case that why are we bulldozing surf breaks and at the same time building baseball diamonds that 20 people use on the weekend when we have surf breaks that hundreds of people use every day. These are sacred spaces and incredibly valuable recreation amenities. Um, uh, and so one of the things that I did uh, about five or six years ago was look into how can we help the businesses that operate in these places and, and us as uh, surfers, and, and uh, snow enthusiasts, how can we educate ourselves to be more sustainable in those environments? And so it seemed to me at the time that there was a big gap in this market for sustainable hotel certifications. Only going for big hotels, I like to stay in surf resorts that don't have too many people. They weren't being targeted, so uh, I got an intern at San Diego State where I'm a professor and we started working on developing this sustainability certification that we call Stoke Certified. Uh, and the intern turned out to be amazing, graduated magna cum laude, and now he's my business partner in Stoke Certified. And we certify resorts all over the world. Uh, we measure them against more than 130 sustainability metrics, not just environmental, but economic and social, cultural, cultural heritage issues. And in this way, we're working with businesses that really don't want to destroy these incredibly valuable sacred spaces. They want to do... Uh, good things for those. They want to advocate for their local communities and local culture, but they're just not quite sure how to do that. Well, luckily the knowledge is out there. We just need to move it into those right areas. So that's what we're attempting to do at surf and snow resorts, at surf and snow destinations, and increasingly in events in those spaces as well. 
I don't see any more hands going up. Oh, we got some back here. Never mind. Everybody decides at the same time they want to throw them up. I'm going to go to the closest one to me over here. Stand up. Okay, so um, you were talking about how the number one problem right now is the offshore drilling. So the way I see it is the problem is that when you're in states like California, you know, they have offshore drilling, North Carolina, they, those people easily no, it's no good and vote against it. So how are you going to reach all the other states, like the inland states and all the other states in the United States that don't get it, don't see it, it doesn't affect them, so vote against it because they think it means money in their pocket even though it doesn't. Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, if it's a red state, blue state question, um, you know, a lot of the the opposition on the East Coast, which has faced this threat twice, uh, is actually really bipartisan because if you own a hotel on the beach in South Carolina, regardless of your politics, that offshore rig is going to be a threat to your economy. So we we're actually able to build incredible grassroots opposition up and down the East Coast. Uh, in terms of inland communities, the beach is the number one favorite destination in America, 180 million visits a year. So, you know, almost everybody goes on vacation at the beach. So I think that's how you, how you communicate to folks that are not living on the beach. You say, hey, you know, and, you know, you can ask anybody in the planet to close their eyes and visualize a beach, and they, they can do it, and it's paradise. And so I think that's how you convince them that uh, they care too. And they may not be business owners, but there's a lot more of us than people who stand to profit from, uh, from offshore drilling. So if we use our voice, uh, we can win. like, oh, right, your senators are right. You can't, well, you know, in California, I mean, they're not going to vote for it. It's like we know that. We're, and I live in California, so that's where I vote. So how do, what are you doing with Surf Rider Foundation particularly, and what can we do, like, to follow your lead or to back you up in the other states in the United States that don't get it? Call somebody tomorrow who lives someplace other than California and tell them this is an issue that's really important to them. They probably don't know about it, and uh, get them to get engaged. You know, I think that's one way. Um, we're also organizing here. I mean, California is definitely not off the map. California state waters go out three miles. After three miles, out to 200 miles is federal waters. So the state doesn't control that. Um, we're, so we're still fighting like hell here in California, and of course we'd expect most of our elected officials to support that, but there's, you know, I live in Rohrbacher's district in Orange County, he's pro oil drilling, so his fate will be decided in, in November, so go knock on doors in Rohrbacher's district or ISA's district, which is Harkey versus a guy named Levin. There's still work to be done here in California, no question, uh, about 60 miles south of here. every day okay. surfrider.org <laughs> yep chat chat we actually just had this conversation specifically about drilling right here in los angeles and what just happened a couple years ago and it always comes back to the same thing for you every time it's grassroots it's local every single time it is it's uh you know it's the way you change the world all right everybody uh give it up for one more panel <laughs>